Hey guys, Pastor Tanner here. Discourse analysis for the rest of us. I don't know about you, when I saw that Dr. Steve Runge was releasing all of his discourse analysis materials years ago, I got super excited. I didn't know a lot about discourse analysis, but I jumped right in because I thought this was going to help me in my studies. But once I started to examine the resources, I was kind of stumped. I didn't really know how to utilize these things, and so I put them on the shelf and really didn't touch them. But here recently, I wanted to ask myself if there was a way that I could utilize discourse analysis even without jumping way deep into the topic. The fact of the matter is, if you've tried to do some study in this area, you recognize that it is a deep, deep well to draw from. Well, I think that I found a good way to access the discourse analysis materials without having a lot of knowledge of the original languages and without being able to really understand all of the in-depth complexities. So here in this video, I want to show you how I've learned to utilize the discourse analysis materials for the layman, for somebody who doesn't use a lot of original languages, and for somebody who needs some quick access to some deep insights. Let me show you. Now, what is discourse analysis, you might ask? Discourse analysis is concerned with word and sentence level relationships, okay? If you look over here on the left, this is something I got from Rungi. Oftentimes, we get mired in word studies, okay? We're really focused on the individual words themselves. That can be really good, but that doesn't always tell us how the words are being used in a sentence, okay? And as you move up from words to propositions all the way up to discourse, we're now getting into the nitty gritty of how words are utilized in sentences. So discourse analysis is designed to help you with your exegesis. It's designed to help you somewhat along the lines of sentence diagramming, okay? Trying to figure out how each of these individual chunks make up a sentence. Now you may be thinking to yourself, man, I'm not going to have access to these discourse materials because I don't speak the original languages. But I don't think that's the case. Now yes, you're going to get the greatest benefit from discourse analysis if you understand the original languages. But even if you don't, I think that you can actually utilize the tools that I'm going to show you, even if you're an English only speaker, so stay tuned. Now, the words in the discourse have what I call a reciprocal relationship, okay? They feed into one another. So the insights you glean from the word study is going to help you understand the discourse, but understanding the discourse is also going to give you insight into the word study. This is very important because a lot of people do in depth word studies without doing anything along the lines of discourse. A little bit of both is going to help a lot. At this point, let me give you a practical example that I got from Rungi that shows us how discourse analysis actually works. You see, Discourse analysis recognizes that the way you say something is almost as important as what you're actually saying. Rungi constantly says this. He says, choice implies meaning, okay? Choice implies meaning. The fact of the matter is that when we use language, there are many different ways in which we can say the same information. And the ways that we select often hint at individual shades of meaning. So one thing Rungi says is at a base level, we might say something like, you did great. Okay, you did great is a very, very basic way of stating something. It's essentially neutral. Although if I insert one single word here and I say, although you did great, now all of a sudden you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Okay, that simple word, although being inserted in front of the information you did great now implies something negative. I'm going to critique you in some way, shape or form. This happens not only in English, but it also happens in Greek and Hebrew too. These little connecting words, these little phrases that we use often tell us a great deal about the shades of meaning underneath the base level text. If I change that simple word, although, into the word seriously, seriously, you did great. That also brings with it its own connotations. This is true in all languages, even the biblical languages. Now, Rungi, in his discourse grammar, goes in-depth into all of these little connecting words in Greek, for example. I want to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Don't get me wrong. It would help if you understood all of those individual words, but I think we can get up and running fast utilizing the glossary. Let me show you all the resources. Now, there's two extremely important resources for utilizing discourse analysis in an easy-to-use format, okay? These resources are the discourse data sets. There's one for Hebrew, and there is one for Greek, okay? Now, the reason I'm bringing these up is you need to make sure that you have these in your library, the Lexham Discourse Hebrew Bible and the Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament. Now, if you open these on your own, you may not actually be helped. They have a little bit of help information on what to use, but you may not 
understand how they actually function in your library. Well, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to pick an English translation that you do not use very often, okay? This is because we're going to set this English translation up with visual filters that actually utilize the discourse analysis data sets. I'm going to pick the Lexham English Bible. Don't get me wrong. This is a great translation, but I rarely reference it because a lot of people don't know about this translation. It's Faith Life's own. Well, it's perfect for actually setting up for discourse analysis. And so I went ahead and brought it up here, and I'm going to show you how to set up the visual filters. For visual filters, you're going to want to come up here to these triple dots that are organized in a triangle, and you're going to want to click on it. Now, because I'm using this English Bible for discourse analysis only, I want everything else turned off, okay? So underneath the visual filters, I check resource, and then I check Bible text only, Bible text formatting, chapter verse numbers, footnote indicators, and non-Bible text. I find that each of these give me the best setup for utilizing the discourse data sets. Now, if you scroll down a little bit further, you will see discourse features Greek and discourse features Hebrew. Check these on and make sure all of the sub points underneath them are checked as well. Once you've done that, you've essentially set up this English Bible to actually be set up in order to do discourse analysis only. And this is what it looks like when you click off. This is what the discourse analysis is all about. Notice how all of the verses are broken out into individual chunks, and they're also typed based on whether or not they're a sentence, they're a subpoint, they're a complex, etc. Not only that, you have all of the discourse pointers within the text itself that you can click on, and I'll show you how those work. You see, each of these are tied to the Lexham Hebrew Bible glossary, okay? So when I click that, it's going to bring up that specific entry within the Lexham Hebrew Bible glossary. Now, notice here, it says, we have sinned against you, we have abandoned our God. And when I click that, it takes me over to the glossary, and it says, this is a changed reference. The use of a different expression to refer to an established participant or to recharacterize the participant or highlight some thematically important information or to explicitly indicate the current center of attention. By switching from a proper name to a more generic reference that connects one participant to another. Example, his mother instead of Hannah. Now notice what the discourse analysis is telling us at this point. It's saying that here God is being referred to in one way and then it switches within the narrative. That's noteworthy. It's that little change in grammar. It's that little change, that little addition of one word that is actually going to completely transform how we understand the passage. It says, then the Israelites cried out to Yahweh saying, we have sinned against you. We have abandoned our God. Oh, I understand why there's a changed reference here. Notice that they were referring to God directly. We have sinned against you, but then they changed. They instead said, we have abandoned our God. That's significant. Why? Because now they're recognizing, not only talking to God himself, but you are our God. You are the God who has saved us, and we have abandoned you, the one who has drawn so close to us. This little adjustment in language, here recognized in the English, is actually super significant for understanding this verse. So that's it. This is the most basic way to utilize the discourse analysis if you don't speak a lot of the original languages and you just want to dive in. You can go ahead and bring this individual English Bible up that you've set up and you can just click on all of the individual markers and it will take you to the glossary and you can utilize those to see what it's marking out for you. Do this alongside your word level study and you're going to be feeding into that reciprocal relationship as you dig into this individual passage. Now, suppose you want to dig in a little bit deeper rather than utilizing just the English translation. Well, there's three other ways to gain some insight from discourse analysis in a very easy and straightforward manner. The first thing I want you to see is by setting up a multi-resource display so that you can actually bring up the original Greek or Hebrew alongside of it. So let me show you how to do that. I click up here on the multiple resources display, and I've already got mine set up, so it shows it. I'm going to drag this over so you can see it a little bit better. And just under this drop down arrow, I want you to look for the Lexham Discourse Bible, okay? If you don't see it right away, you can just type Lexham Discourse Bible or Lexham Discourse right over here into the search bar, and it's going to give you this as a hit, and you can click on it, and it's going to show you that it has two resources available. That's the Hebrew and Greek versions, okay? So when you click Lexham Discourse Bible and you set this up as a multi resource display, then what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to scroll through and 
you're going to be able to see it in its Hebrew form as well as its English form. And if you go somewhere into the New Testament, you're going to be able to see it in its Greek form as well as its English form. That's a really easy way to help you as you're looking back and forth and make sure you're getting a good sense of the original languages. Now, if your formatting on your Lexham Discourse Greek New Testament or Hebrew Bible doesn't look like mine over here, that's because you have to go into the individual resource and set it up that way. So all you have to do is you have to come over here and you just have to type in Lexham Discourse and you put in the Greek or the Hebrew, okay? And what you need to do is go in and select the visual filters in this way. I do Bible text only corresponding selection and is very, very straightforward and it will lay it out in this format. So you might have to play with these individual visual filters to get it to come out appropriately. But once it's in place, then this multi-resource display will do it for you. The second way you can get a little bit more insight into discourse analysis, even with very little background, is to go ahead and bring up Rungi's practical Greek grammar, okay? So he has a discourse Greek grammar and this one is actually gonna help you quite a bit and let me just put practical here to make sure I get the right one. Okay, it's right here. Rungi put this together. It's over 400 pages, if you include the bibliography at least. And it can be difficult to slog through 400 pages of all this material. But you don't have to do that, okay? Once you start digging into these individual markers within the glossary, you can also utilize the grammar to go a little bit deeper. Let's say the glossary isn't giving you everything you need. Well, you can dig into the grammar itself to find more information. Finally, guys, I want you to know Rungi has written four commentaries that are called high definition commentaries, okay? These high definition commentaries are based on a discourse analysis style. So if you go ahead and bring up one of the high definition commentaries, you're actually going to be able to utilize all of this discourse analysis information and understand it, okay? So he's done this for Galatians, James, Romans, and Philippians. And you can see right here, if you bring one of them up, you can scroll through. And they're pretty cool. He's got little pictures that go in depth into other material and other information. And he's discussing all of this data from a discourse analysis perspective. So I think this is really, really helpful. In addition to the little insight I showed you in Judge. 10, which I found while I was studying for Jephthah this week. I also want to show you just one more insight. This is from his Philippians commentary, okay? If you actually dig into Philippians 2.2, 2, you will begin to see that there is an interesting construction in the Greek. So if we go to Philippians 2, right here, notice how this is set up. Even if you don't have the original languages, look at this. You'll notice it says, therefore, if there is any, if any, if any, if any. That's a very curious way of constructing things. You should pay attention to that from a discourse perspective. Well, what Rungi says is all of these if this, if this, if this are collecting together in a cumulative way to make a single point. Then be like-minded or agree, i.e. verse 2, complete my joy so that you are in agreement. This is an insight that you can gain from the discourse level of study based upon those individual words that are being selected. That's it, guys. I want you to know, I wasn't sure how to utilize discourse analysis myself in my own study, but once I dug into it this way, I now have a good grasp of it, and I feel that I can utilize this profitably week after week to aid in my study of the passage. Appreciate you all hanging out in our channel. Take care. God bless. Bye.